It's day one of 60 days of studying the masters and I'm painting Van Gogh today. Want to join me? In this series, we're going to take an hour each day to study the work of one master artist, but we're going to do it in whatever medium you feel comfortable with. We're not trying to replicate the artist's style or medium. The point is to look at things a bit differently, learn a little bit about the artist, and have fun. Now, I always thought that Van Gogh was an impressionist painter, but he came after the likes of Renoir, Monet, Degas, and Cassatt. The post-impressionists like Van Gogh and Gauguin were more bold with their colors. They applied heavy use of lines and were unafraid of black paint. We've all heard the story about how Van Gogh cut off his own ear. He suffered from severe depression and died in poverty. I think the tragedy of Van Gogh resonates with artists because like him we feel our own battles with mental health and the constant need to be successful with the art will lead us down the same tragic path. But doctors understand and can treat mental health so much better in the 21st century. And we have so many more career choices Van Gogh didn't have. Gaming, films, social media. So don't give up on your dream of being an artist. We have it so much better than Van Gogh did. And that's my painting in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day two of 60 days of studying the masters and I'm painting John William Waterhouse today. Want to join me? The Lady of Shalott is possibly one of Waterhouse's best known works. Based on the poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, the painting depicts a woman living under a tragic curse. Isolated in a tower on an island called Shalott, she lives upstream from King Arthur's kingdom. The curse allows her to see the outside world only through a reflection in a mirror. As she watches the world go by, she captures the reflection by weaving it into a tapestry. This is the fabric she sits on in the boat, showing scenes from her visions in the mirror woven at her loom. One day she glimpses the reflected image of the handsome knight Sir Lancelot riding on a horse. Unable to resist, she leaves her loom and turns to look at him directly, at which the mirror cracks and she realizes the curse has befallen her. The punishment that follows from defying the curse results in her taking to a boat and drifting downstream to Camelot, singing her last song, but dying before she reaches the castle. Waterhouse's work was part of the academic pre-Raphaelite and romantic movements. I'm such a hopeless romantic, so this was really fun for me. And that's my painting in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day three of 60 days of studying the masters and I'm painting sculptor Guillaume Gives today. Want to join me? This is Lugine Dumont, otherwise known as Lucifer. Okay, let's just establish now that I'm going to butcher every language for the next 57 days, okay? But I'm trying. I am trying. So aside from being a wonderful sculpture, there's a pretty great story behind this. Apparently, in 1848, a church in Belgium commissioned Guillaume's brother Joseph to sculpt Lucifer for part of an elaborate pulpit in the church. So Joseph finishes the sculpture and it's installed, but it was deemed too beautiful and they were afraid that it was tempting young girls. So they removed it and hired Joseph's older brother Guillaume to sculpt a more modest Lucifer. But I gotta say, I think Yam's version is even hotter. No pun intended. I find that I enjoy painting sculptures so much more than other works of art. I'm able to interpret the form and shape and lighting in my own way without the distraction of the artist's paint strokes or color choices. I feel like when studying sculpture, I learn so much more and I can make my own art from it. Something a bit more personal. What about you? And that's my painting in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day four of 60 days of studying the masters and I'm studying Edward Hopper's Nighthawks today. Want to join me? Hopper said that his 1942 painting Nighthawks was inspired by a restaurant on New York's Greenwich Avenue. But the image, with its carefully constructed composition and lack of narrative, has a timeless universal quality that transcends its particular locale. Considered to be one of the best known images of 20th century art, the painting depicts an all-night diner in which three customers, all lost in their own thoughts, have congregated. Fluorescent lights had just come into use in the early 1940s, and the all-night diner emits an eerie glow. Hopper eliminated any reference to an entrance, and the viewer, drawn to the light, is shut out from the scene by a seamless wedge of glass. I've always been fascinated when an artist can make us feel an emotion from a single image. Hopper's Nighthawk seems to invoke feelings of loneliness, foreboding, sadness, though I wonder if older generations might even feel nostalgia. I always like to think that the three patrons are plotting a heist, but now the diner guy's heard too much. See? He's heard too much. <laughs> what stories or emotions do you get from this painting? And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day five of 60 days of studying the masters and today we're studying Johannes Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring. Want to join me? So on day three, we established that I will absolutely butcher every language, including the English language, during these studies. Today, I'd also like to let it be known across the lands that I slept through pretty much all of my art history classes. I'm learning this stuff as I go, and I'm having fun doing it, and my googling may not be the best, and I look forward to friendly discussions in the comments. Today's study is based on Vermeer's most famous painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. Done in 1665, it is not a portrait, but a trony, a painting of an imaginary figure. Tronies depict a certain type of character, in this case, a girl in an exotic dress wearing an oriental turban and an improbably large pearl in her ear. It wasn't always named Girl with a Pearl Earring. Originally, Vermeer simply called it Painted in the Turkish Fashion. Later, he called it Portrait in an Antique Costume. It was then changed to The Girl with a Turban in 1675, but it wasn't until 1995 that the name Girl with a Pearl Earring was given. And you know what? I think the name's gonna stick. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. 
It's day six of 60 days of studying the masters. Today we're studying Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. Want to join me? Painted in 1907, The Kiss is a blend of different schools of art. The gold leaf harkens back to such Byzantine works as the mosaics in the church of San Vital. The composition of the works reflects the influence of Japanese prints that was also evident in some early Impressionist paintings. The contrasting patterns of the two lovers' cloaks reflects the arts and crafts movement of the era. And overall, Klimt imbued The Kiss with elements of his signature Art Nouveau style. While many of Klimt's artworks were destroyed by retreating German troops during World War II, The Kiss, however, remained on exhibit at the Belvedere and it survived. I learned so much about this painting while doing research on it, but also so much more by actually studying it. The color choices, the intricacies, and the patterns, all the little details you just wouldn't notice otherwise. When you take the time to draw or paint a work of art, you see so much more than you ever would just looking at it. By studying the art like this, you feel closer to the art and the artist. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day seven of 60 days of studying the masters and today we're studying Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with thorn necklace and hummingbird. Wanna join me? I knew nothing about Frida Kahlo before doing this study, but here's what I learned about this amazing woman's life. Frida Kahlo was a Mexican painter known for her many portraits, especially self-portraits and works inspired by the nature and artifacts of Mexico. When she was six years old, a bout of polio led her to become disabled. Frida didn't always wanna be an artist. She was intending to be a doctor until she was in a horrible bus accident at the age of 18. The accident left her in lifelong crippling pain. During her recovery, she rediscovered her childhood love of art. Kahlo painted in the surrealist style and was able, through her art, to deal with the experiences of chronic pain. In her lifetime, she had over 30 operations. Life experience is a common theme in Kahlo's approximately 200 paintings, sketches, and drawings, 55 of which are self-portraits. She said, I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone, because I am the person I know the best. Her work continues to inspire people today and is known as an icon for Hispanics, feminism, and the LGBTQ community. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day eight of 60 days of studying the masters and today I'm studying Katsushika Hokusai's The Great Wave. Want to join me? Under the Wave of Kanagawa, also known as The Great Wave, comes from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. It's what's known as a woodblock print and was published sometime between 1829 and 1833 during Japan's Edo period. At age 12, Hokusai's father sent him to work at a bookstore. At age 16, he apprenticed as an engraver and began to produce his own illustrations in his spare time. At 18, he was accepted as an apprentice to Katsukawa Shunsho, one of the foremost Yukio artists of the time. In 1804, he became famous as an artist himself. And in 1814, he published the first of 50 volumes of sketches entitled manga. Yeah, you heard that correctly. This guy invented manga. Hakuzai produced The Great Wave when he was around 70 years old. The series is considered his masterpiece and made use of the recently introduced Prussian blue pigment. It is Hokuzai's most famous work and is often considered the most recognizable work of Japanese art in the world. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day nine of studying the masters and today we're studying Navajo artist R.C. Gorman's The Wish. Want to join me? The Wish, or Deseo, is a stone lithograph created in 1995 by Gorman, who was born in Chinle, Arizona. I'm using thinner lines in this study to capture Gorman's delicate line work. His father was one of the original 29 Navajo code talkers that developed the unbreakable code American forces used in the Pacific Theater during World War II. R.C. Gorman grew up in a traditional Navajo Hogan and began drawing at the age of three. Notice how I'm using a wet-on-wet -wet technique to try to recreate how his colors flow from one into another. His grandmother helped raise him, steeping him in the Navajo legends and genealogy of his ancestors. She was the one who kindled his desire to become an artist. While tending sheep with his aunt, Gorman used to draw on rocks, sand, and mud and made sculptures with clay. Gorman's paintings are primarily of indigenous women and characterized by fluid forms and vibrant colors, though he also worked in sculptures, ceramics, and stone lithography. He was also an avid lover of cuisine, authoring cookbooks with accompanying drawings called Nudes with Foods. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 10 of 60 days of studying the masters and today we're studying African-American sculptor Augusta Savage. Want to join me? The portrait of John Henry was sculpted in 1940 by Augusta Savage. Augusta moved to Harlem in 1921 and studied at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. She originally received a French scholarship in 1922, but the offer was rescinded when white Alabama students who had received similar grants refused to travel to France unless she was removed from the group. It was this discrimination that led her to a lifelong fight for civil rights and the recognition of black artists. Although she was a leading artist of the Harlem Renaissance, low sales and lack of financial resources dogged Augusta's career. Many of her works were done in plaster and she was unable to raise the money to have them cast in more permanent materials. So not all of her work survived. Augusta Savage recognized that the legacy she passed on to the post-Harlem Renaissance generation might well be more valued than her actual art. I've created nothing really beautiful, really lasting, Savage declared in 1935, but if I can inspire just one of these youngsters to develop the talent I know they possess, then my monument will be in their work. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. 
It's day 11 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Ask Me No More by Sir Lawrence Almatadema. Want to join me? So Alma Tadima is one of my favorite artists of the Romantic and Pre-Raphaelite movement. And while his life and works are inspiring, I wanted to take a moment to say, I actually didn't like how my painting came out. And that's okay. These are one hour sketches. But it's hard as an artist to post work you're not proud of. My line work is stiff. The faces are bleh. The hands are, well, we won't talk about them. I just wanted my fellow artists to know, you're not alone. We all have off days. We all have pieces that just don't click. And that's okay. But enough about me not liking my art. Alma Tadima. His paintings are elaborate, romantic, breathtaking. My favorite painting of his is entitled Spring. Please look it up. It is just beautiful. Ask Me No More is based upon a poem by Tennyson that reads, Ask me no more, thy fate and mine are sealed. I strove against the stream, and all in vain. Let the great river take me to the main. No more, dear love, for at a touch I yield. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 12 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Jimson Weed by Georgia O'Keeffe. Want to join me? Georgia O'Keeffe was born on November 15, 1887, and grew up on a farm near Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. At a very early age, O'Keeffe was determined to be an artist and went on to study at the Art Institutes of Chicago and the Art Students League in New York, where she learned the technique of traditional painting. She shifted her art style dramatically after studying the ideas of Arthur Wesley Dow, and it was at this point that O'Keeffe began to move towards abstract art. In summer of 1929, O'Keeffe made a trip to northern New Mexico. The stark landscapes and indigenous American and Hispanic cultures of the region inspired a new direction in O'Keeffe's art. In the 1950s, O'Keeffe began to travel internationally, and her paintings evoked the spectacular places she visited, including the mountain peaks of Peru and Japan's Mount Fuji. Georgia O'Keeffe died in Santa Fe in 1986, at the age of 98, and is considered to be one of the most significant artists of the 20th century, renowned for her contribution to modern art worldwide, and has even been called the mother of American modernism. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 13 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Scream by Edvard Munch. Want to join me? The Scream is a popular name given to a composition created by Norwegian Expressionist artist Edvard Munch in 1893. Munch recalled that he had been out for a walk at sunset when suddenly the setting sun's light turned the clouds a blood red. He sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. Munch wrote, My father was temperamentally nervous and obsessively religious, to the point of psychoneurosis. From him I inherited the seeds of madness. The angels of fear, sorrow, and death stood by my side since the day I was born. His father reprimanded his children by telling them that their mother was looking down from heaven and grieving over their misbehavior. The oppressive religiousness, Edward's poor health, and the vivid ghost stories helped inspire his macabre visions and nightmares. The boy felt that death was constantly advancing on him. Munch would later write, I inherited two kinds of mankind's most frightful enemies, the heritage of consumption and insanity. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 14 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying John Everett Millay's Ophelia. Want to join me? This painting is based on a scene from Shakespeare's Hamlet, where Ophelia is driven out of her mind and falls into a stream and drowns. Millet painted Ophelia between 1851 and 1852 in two separate locations. He began the background in July 1851, painting outside by the Hogsmill River at Ewell in Surrey. In accordance with the aims of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, he painted with close observation of nature. Now, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood is one of my favorite movements. Essentially, a bunch of British artists in the 1840s decided it was time to purify the art of their time by adopting adopting the styles of medieval and early renaissance paintings, and it's very romantic and powerful and colorful and you'll be seeing more pre-Raphaelite stuff over the next 46 days. So anyways, Millet painted the figure of Ophelia afterwards inside the Gower Street studio in London. The model, Elizabeth Siddle, was required to pose over a four month period in a bath full of water kept warm by lamps underneath. On one occasion, the lamps went out, causing her to catch a severe cold. Her father threatened the artist with legal action until he agreed to pay the doctor's bill. Ophelia is one of the most popular pre-Raphaelite works and resides in the Tate Museum in London. And I really want to go to the Tate Museum in London one day. So many of my favorite paintings are there. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 15 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Rembrandt's The Man with the Golden Helmet. Want to join me? Rembrandt was a Dutch Golden Age painter, and is generally considered to be one of the greatest visual artists in the history of the art, and the most important in Dutch art history. So, remember when I said I was not an expert, and that I slept through art history? Yeah, well, funny story. I finished this study during our live painting session, and it turns out that this is, in fact, not an original Rembrandt. Apparently, it was discovered 330 years later that it might have been done by one of his students. So, I spent an hour studying one of Rembrandt's students' work. Now, I think I saw that it was just this one person's opinion, and I'm sure they're a professional, and they're quoted as saying, it's not a fake, 
It remains a great masterful work, but they're still thinking that it might have been done by one of his students. Regardless, I did have fun studying it, and I think it came out okay. Art history nerds, please comment, stitch, or duet this with your thoughts on this. Is this a Rembrandt, or is it one of his students' work? And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 16 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Judith and Her Maidservant by Artemisia Genelleschi. Want to join me? Working by her father's side, Artemisia was producing professional work by the age of 15. After moving to Florence, she was heavily involved in the courtly culture. This provided her with more patrons and widened her education and exposed her to the arts, learning to read and write and becoming familiar with musical and theatrical performances. Artemisia is considered to be the most accomplished 17th century artist and arguably the greatest female artist of the Baroque age. Not only did she become a highly successful artist in an age when guilds and academies closed their doors to women, but she communicated a powerful female perspective and strength in a world where none existed. But while learning about Artemisia Genelleschi, I was disturbed to find that the majority of writings about her centered around her rape and subsequent trial, and virtually ignored her incredible work and indelible contribution to the Baroque period. Her surviving paintings are self-evidently autobiographical, depicting strong women taking justice into their own hands and deserve to be revered for the classics that they are. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 17 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Oscar Claude Monet's Woman with a Parasol. Want to join me? Okay, there's going to be some French names in here, and I'm going to butcher them, so uh, my apologies in advance. Oscar Claude Monet was born in 1840 and was a French painter and one of the founders of the Impressionist movement. He studied at the Académie Suisse and under the academic history painter Charles Glier, where he was a classmate of Auguste Renoir. His early works included landscapes, seascapes, and portraits, but attracted little attention. A key early influence was Eugène Baudin, who introduced him to the concept of plein air painting. Monet loved to document the French countryside, which led him to paint the same scenes and locations many times so he could capture different times of day over different seasons. His fame and popularity soared in the second half of the 20th century when he became one of the world's most famous painters and a source of inspiration for burgeoning groups of artists. Now all that aside, is it me or did my study come out looking like a Studio Ghibli poster? I mean, it's totally an accident, this wasn't intentional, but I can't be the only one who sees it, right? And that's my sketch in about an hour, show me yours. It's day 18 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters and today we're studying Work Interrupted by William Adolf Bougereau. Want to join me? Bougereau was born to a family of wine and olive merchants in 1852 in La Rochelle, France. He was destined to enter the family business, but his uncle recognized his talent early on and arranged a commission for Bougereau to paint portraits of his parishioners. And when his aunt matched the sum he earned, Bougereau went to Paris and became a student at École des Beaux Arts. To supplement his formal training in drawing, he attended anatomical dissections and studied historical costumes and archaeology. He won the coveted Prix de Rome in 1850, and his reward was to stay in the Villa Medici in Rome, Italy, where he was able to study firsthand the Renaissance artists and their masterpieces. As he grew in popularity, he used his influence to open many French art institutions to women for the first time, including Académie Française. Near the end of his day, he described his love of his art. Each day I go to my studio full of joy. In the evening, when obliged to stop because of darkness, I can scarcely wait for the next morning to come. If I cannot give myself to my dear painting, I am miserable. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 19 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Auto Portrait by Tamar de Lempitska. Want to join me? Okay, buckle up. This one's an interesting one. Lempitska was a bisexual Art Deco painter who rescued her husband from the secret police during the Russian Revolution. She helped bring Art Deco to fashion magazines like Harper's Bazaar, stole a Hungarian baron away from his mistress after she was commissioned to do her portrait, which she purposely painted the mistress in an unflattering way, married the baron, then had to flee hungry from the Nazis, and had her ashes cast in a volcano in Mexico. Seriously, look this woman up. She lived a life. Auto Portrait is a self-portrait she painted for a German fashion magazine called Die Dame to celebrate the independence of women, portraying herself as a personification of cold beauty, independence, wealth, and inaccessibility, all wrapped up in a green Bugatti. I'm sure I still made a mess of the Polish pronunciations, but I wanted to thank those of you who helped me out. I hope I did a little better this time. I'm really enjoying learning about all of these artists, and I hope you are too. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 20 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Santa and Boy by J.C. Leindecker. Want to join me? I love J.C. Leindecker, so this one's going to be fun. The Leindecker family immigrated from Germany in 1882 to Chicago. After graduating from the Chicago of Art Institute, J.C. studied in Paris for a year, where he was exposed to the works of Toulouse-Lautrec, Jules Charest, and Alphonse Mucha. In 1899, Leindecker returned to Chicago and received his first commission for a Saturday Evening Post cover. He would ultimately produce 322 covers for the magazine. He became the most famous illustrator of the 1920s, and his style was known the world over. In fact, if J.C. Leindecker's work looks familiar to you, it's because it inspired a young artist 
artist named Norman Rockwell, who studied Leyendecker's work closely in hopes of getting his own art on the Saturday Evening Post one day. What is often speculated is that J.C. Leyendecker's model-turned-friend-turned-manager, Charles Beach, was in fact his lover and partner. Being the early 1900s though, they had to keep their love a secret. J.C. Leyendecker and Charles Beach were together for 50 years from the day they met until J.C. Leyendecker's death at the age of 77. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 21 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Dancers by Edgar Degas. Want to join me? Born in Paris, France in 1834, Degas was a French artist famous for his work in painting, sculptures, printmaking, and drawing. He's regarded as one of the founders of Impressionism, although he rejected the term and preferred to be called a realist. His early ambition was to be a history painter, but in his early 30s, he changed course and became a classical painter of modern life. He's especially identified with the subject of dance, and over half of his work depicts dancers. Degas was undoubtedly a merciless, cantankerous man. He was a misogynist. Pierre seemed almost afraid of his antagonism towards women, which is especially troubling considering the existing sexist norms of his society. Degas' studio was once visited by an inspector from the police morals unit, wanting to know why so many little girls were coming and going. Think of it, his landlord said. The district of prostitutes and laundresses were alarmed. But despite all of this, his portraits are considered to be among the finest in the history of art. I'm really enjoying learning about both the art and the artist, though sometimes I'm a little disappointed by the artist. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 22 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Stroll by the Seaside by Joaquin Sorolla. Want to join me? Joaquin Sorolla y Bastida was born in Valencia, Spain in 1863. In 1888, he married Clotilde Garcia del Castillo, who was his muse and subject of many of his paintings. They had a passionate relationship, and when traveling, Sorolla would write her every day, often sending flowers inside the letters. Sorolla's other great love was his home city of Valencia, where he returned every year to paint the intense light and broad horizons of the coast. He had a reputation for beach scenes, and many of his paintings were done in plein air, and had grains of sand embedded in their densely painted surfaces. I love that. I love that you can find grains of sand in his paintings. Now, this guy was a romantic, and my wife Donna insisted I include this quote from a letter from Soroya to his wife. All my love is focused on you. Despite my great love for our children, you are much more than them, for so many reasons that there is no need to mention. You are my body, my life, my mind, my perpetual ideal. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 23 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Luncheon of the Boating Party by Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Want to join me? Even at an early age, Renoir showed a natural ability for drawing, but he exhibited an even greater talent for singing. In fact, his family provided him music lessons, but their financial circumstances were dire. And at 13, Renoir had to stop music and pursue an apprenticeship at a porcelain factory. During these tough times, a young Renoir sought refuge in the galleries of the Louvre. The owner of the factory recognized the apprentice's talent and helped Renoir get into art school. In April 1874, after a series of salon rejections, he joined forces with Monet, Sisley, and Pissarro to mount the first Impressionist exhibition. By the end of the 1870s, Renoir was finally a successful and fashionable painter. In 1890, he married, and Renoir painted many scenes of his wife in his daily life. Renoir painted during his last 20 years of life, even after arthritis severely limited his mobility. And this is my favorite part. In 1919, at 78 years old, Renoir visited the Louvre to see his own paintings hanging with those of the old masters he studied in his youth. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 24 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Banjo Lessons by Henry Oswa Tanner. Want to join me? Tanner was an African-American artist who earned his international acclaim for his religious paintings. His father was a prominent minister and his mother was a former slave who escaped the South through the Underground Railroad. His parents gave him a middle name that commemorated the struggle of Osawatomi between the pro and the anti-slavery partisans. During World War I, Tanner worked for the Red Cross during which time he painted images from the front lines of the war. His works featuring African-American troops were rare during the war. Like many American artists in the 19th century, Tanner went to Europe. He sold paintings of the Bible stories to finance his trip to Palestine, Egypt, and Morocco. Tanner kept close ties to his native country and was proud of his contribution as a black American, but he chose to live in France, where he felt that his race mattered less to the other artists and critics. In his adopted country of France in 1923, Tanner was appointed Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, the highest national order of merit. He considered this citation by the French government to be the greatest honor of his illustrious career. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 25 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Flaming June by Sir Frederick Layton. Want to join me? One of my favorite pieces of pre-Raphaelite art. Flaming June was originally supposed to be inside one of Layton's other works called Summer Slumber, but he liked it so much that he decided to make it its own painting. He was one of the most successful of the Victorian painters, having sold one of his early works to Queen Victoria, and George Bernard Shaw was said to have based his sexually ambiguous Henry Higgins of Pygmalion on him. And for those who don't know, Pygmalion is also known as My Fair Lady. Layton remained a bachelor his entire life, but rumors of his sexuality and personal life remain debated to this day. His 
friend and artist Simeon Solomon was arrested for being gay and his life ruined, so it makes sense that many gay artists kept their sexuality a secret back then. Leighton was knighted at Windsor in 1878. He was the first painter to be given a noble title, making him Baron Leighton of Stretton in the county of Shropshire. Leighton died the next day and is considered the bearer of the shortest lived peerage in history. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 26 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Guernica by Pablo Picasso. Want to join me? In January 1937, Picasso was commissioned to create a large mural for the Spanish Pavilion at the 1937 Paris World's Fair. He struggled with the project's initial sketches, but after reading reports of the April 26 bombing of Guernica, he abandoned his initial ideas, and Guernica has become one of his best-known works and has been regarded by many art critics as the most moving and powerful anti-war painting in history. There's an old Picasso story that I love, and it goes like this. One day, while enjoying his meal at a restaurant, Pablo Picasso, the world's most influential artist at the time, got interrupted by a fan who handed over a napkin to him and said, could you sketch something for me? I'll pay you, name your price. In response, Picasso pulled out a charcoal pencil from his pocket and swiftly sketched an image of a goat. The man reached out to collect the napkin, but Picasso withheld it. You owe me $100,000, he said. The man was outraged. $100,000? Why? That took you no more than 30 seconds to draw. Picasso then crumpled up the napkin and stuffed it into his jacket pocket. You are wrong, he said. It took me 40 years. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 27 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Desperate Man by Gustave Courbet. Want to join me? Painted in 1843, Courbet's The Desperate Man is a self-portrait of the then 24-year-old artist who stares wild-eyed, grasping at his long, unkempt hair. He was the quintessential romantic impression of a tortured artist. This was Courbet at 24, unsure of himself, or where he fit in this world. But just five years later, in 1843, everything changed. Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto came out, and Courbet joined the Socialist Revolution. He had purpose. He had a cause. His painting suddenly focused on one thing, realism showing the world what the working class looked like. Since paintings in large part were funded by either the rich or the church, he felt that the everyday person needed to be seen. To be in a position to translate the customs, the ideas, the appearance of my time, according to my own estimation, he said, to be not only a painter, but a man as well. In short, to create living art, this is my goal. And when I am no longer controversial, I will no longer be important. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 28 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Self-Portrait with a Straw Hat by Elizabeth Louise Viget Lebrun. Want to join me? Born in Paris in 1755, Elizabeth was painting portraits professionally by the time she was in her early teens. She caused a minor public scandal when her self-portrait with her daughter was exhibited with her smiling and open-mouthed. Lay gasp. As her career blossomed, Elizabeth was granted patronage by Marie Antoinette. She painted more than 30 portraits of the queen and her family, leading to the common perception that she was the official portraitist of Marie Antoinette. During the French Revolution, after the arrest of the royal family, Elizabeth fled France with her young daughter Julie. She remained in exile for 12 years, traveling through Europe from Italy to Austria and Germany, where she painted to survive. In Russia, she painted the grandchildren of Catherine the Great. As she traveled across Europe, her fame grew even more, with her portraits being so wonderful she was known as the best mirror in the land. In her lifetime, Elizabeth created some 660 portraits and 200 landscapes. Sadly, her work was mostly dismissed after her death, a fate of many significant women artists. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 29 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Conan the Destroyer by Frank Frazetta. Want to join me? His talent for drawing was so obvious that his parents enrolled him in the Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts when he was only eight years old. After graduating, he chose a career in comics. He illustrated his first story, The Snowman, for Tally Ho Comics in 1944. In 1954, Frazetta worked on newspaper strips, most notably as a ghostwriter for Lil Abner comic strips. After leaving Lil Abner for harsh working conditions and little pay, Frazetta fell on hard times financially. The one thing he had going for himself was his astonishing speed at which he worked, finishing entire paintings in only a day. Over the next decade, Frazetta would transition to doing paperback illustrations and movie posters. His most notable being the Tarzan series for Edgar Rice Burroughs in Mad Magazine. He became mainly known as a painter in the mid to late 1960s. Frazetta's work on the Conan the Adventurer series was some of his most acclaimed work. He put his heart and soul into the paintings, not only because he was being paid very well, but because he was being allowed to keep his original art. In his final years, a series of strokes left his right arm almost completely paralyzed, and yet he taught himself to draw with his left hand. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 30 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Two Tahitian Women by Paul Gauguin. Want to join me? Born during the revolutionary upheavals throughout Europe, Gauguin's life was one of struggle. His work life was not a success, and his wife, Met, became the chief breadwinner, giving French lessons to trainee diplomats. In 1882, he decided to pursue painting full-time. Vincent van Gogh and his art dealer brother, Theo, purchased three of Gauguin's paintings and arranged to have them hung at a gallery in hopes of introducing Gauguin to wealthy clients. Initially, van Gogh and Gauguin became close friends, but over the years, their relationship deteriorated. According to a much later count of Gauguin's, Vincent confronted Gauguin with a straight 
razor. Later the same evening, he cut off his own ear, wrapped the severed ear in newspaper, and handed it to a woman who worked at a brothel Gauguin and Vincent had both visited and asked her to keep this object carefully in remembrance of me. Yeah, that's not creepy. Vincent was hospitalized the following day and Gauguin left. They never saw each other again, but they continued to correspond. Gauguin spent the final years of his life painting and sculpting in French Polynesia. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 31 of 60 days of studying the masters and today we're studying Zodiac by Alphonse Mucha. Want to join me? Born in the town of Ivanchicha, Moravia, which would be today's Czech Republic, Muka's career was mostly providing illustrations for magazines. But at the end of 1894, his career took a dramatic and unexpected turn when he was given the opportunity to work with French stage actress Sarah Bernhardt. The fame of these posters led to worldwide success and recognition. Muka produced a flurry of paintings, posters, advertisements, and book illustrations, as well as designs for jewelry, carpets, wallpapers, and theater sets in what was initially called the Muka style, but became known as Art Nouveau, French for New Art. His Art Nouveau style was often Imitated. However, this was a style that Muka attempted to distance himself from. He insisted that rather than adhering to any fashionable stylistic form, his paintings came purely from within, and Czech art. He declared that art existed only to communicate a spiritual message, and nothing more. Hence his frustration at the fame he gained through commercial art, when he wanted always to concentrate on more lofty projects that would ennoble art and his birthplace. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 32 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying tea by Mary Cassatt. Want to join me? Despite her obvious talents, her parents objected to her becoming a professional artist, mainly because they were concerned she would be exposed to feminist ideas and bohemian boys. Cassatt overcame her father's objections and moved to Paris with her mother and family friends acting as chaperones. Eventually, she became an apprentice of Edgar Degas, and the two worked side by side for a while. Reportedly, she had some feelings for him, but learned not to expect too much from this curmudgeonly temperamental brute. She was an integral part of the Impressionist movement, but was often not allowed to socialize with the gallery members because she was a woman. Despite this, Mary Cassatt had a long and illustrious career and was even awarded France's Légion d'honneur in 1904 for her contributions to the arts. In 1914, at 70 years old, she was diagnosed with diabetes, rheumatism, neuralgia, and cataracts and was forced to stop painting because she was almost blind. Nonetheless, she took up the cause for women's suffrage and in 1915, she showed 18 works in an exhibition supporting the movement. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 33 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Ecstasy by Maxville Parrish. Want to join me? Parrish entered into an artistic career that lasted more than half of a century and which helped shape the golden age of illustration and visual arts. During his career, he produced almost 900 pieces of art, including calendars, greeting cards, murals, and magazine covers. In his day, everyone recognized the magical world woven by Parrish. He usually worked with the color lapis lazuli in its purest form. His signature use of the color was so powerful that a certain cobalt blue became known as Parrish blue. Similarly, books illustrated by Parrish no longer belonged to those writers, but rather became Parrish books. Maxfield Parrish became unquestionably the most successful and best-known American illustrator of the early part of the 20th century, with his work influencing other notable artists such as Vasserly, Andy Warhol, and even Norman Rockwell. His life was rich and full, and he didn't suffer as many other tortured artists had in the past. He loved the business side of his craft, but he rarely spent any money. He lived in the remote hills of New Hampshire, where he created a make-believe world all his own, and never left. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 34 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Song of the Lark by Jules Breton. Want to join me? Born in 1827 in a small village in France, Breton's paintings were primarily of peasants in the land they inhabited. During his lifetime, he was quite successful. Conversely, and here we go with another Van Gogh tie-in, Vincent Van Gogh, living in poverty, saw Breton's painting, Song of the Lark, loved it so much that he walked barefoot 85 kilometers to tell his contemporary this. But when he got there, Van Gogh turned back after seeing the high walls around Breton's house. And there's another story about this painting that I love. Bill Murray was a young performer who bombed in his first time on stage in Chicago. He was so depressed, he was considering ending his life. As he walked the streets, he came across the Art Institute of Chicago and walked in. He saw this painting, The Song of the Lark, and thought, well, there's a girl who doesn't have a whole lot of prospects, but the sun's coming up anyway, and she's got another chance at it. This gave him hope to try again, to live another day. Stop and think about that for a second. A painting from 1884 saved the life of a man almost 100 years later. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 35 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jacques by Georges-Pierre Seurat. 
Want to join me? After his formal art training and a stint in the military, Soro spent 1883 working on his first major painting, a large canvas titled Bathers at Anier. It was rejected by the Paris Salon, so Soro and some other artists set up a new organization, somewhere where his bold new idea of pointillism could take place. The tiny juxtaposed dots of multicolored paint allowed the viewer's eyes to blend the colors optically rather than having the colors physically blend on the canvas. It took Soro two years to complete this 10 foot wide painting, much of which he spent in the park sketching in preparation of the work. It shows members of of each of the social classes participating in various park activities. A Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte was also the inspiration of James Lapine and Stephen Sondheim's musical Sunday in the Park with George. Since it'd be impossible for me to do this with dots in an hour, I didn't use ink on this one and just went over my pencils with the watercolors, hopefully recreating the softness of Sir Rose pointillism. I don't know if it worked or not, but that's my painting in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 36 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying American Gothic by Grant Wood. Want to join me? In 1930, Wood was inspired to paint a house he came across in Eldon, Iowa. He imagined the kind of people that he fancied should live in that house would be standing up front. This became his most famous painting, American Gothic. The painting is named for the house's architectural style and depicts a farmer standing beside his daughter. Yeah, that's his daughter, not his wife. Wood recruited his sister, Nan Wood Graham, to be the model for the daughter, dressing her in a colonial print apron, mimicking 20th century rural Americana. The model for the father was a family dentist. After obtaining permission from the house's owner, Selma Jones John Johnson and her family, Wood made a sketch the next day in oil paint on Paperboy from the front yard. Wood became the pride of Iowa, and in 1935, Wood accepted a job heading up the art department at the University of Iowa. But a clash with an art historian in the department led to Wood being outed as a homosexual, which led to a forced sabbatical for Wood, who died six years later from pancreatic cancer. He passed away the night before his 51st birthday. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 37 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying It Hung Upon a Thorn by N.C. Wyeth. Want to join me? Newell Converse Wyeth was a pupil of artist Howard Pyle and became one of America's greatest illustrators. After just a few months of studying with Pyle, Wyeth received his first commission to illustrate a bucking bronco for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in 1903. In 1904, the same magazine commissioned him to illustrate a Western story, and Pyle urged Wyeth to go west to acquire direct knowledge. During his time out west, Wyeth worked as a cowboy, visited the Navajo in Arizona and New Mexico, and he worked as a mail carrier. Over his career, Wyeth created more than 3,000 paintings and illustrated 112 books. 25 of them Scribner's classics, including Robin Hood, Treasure Island, Homer's Odyssey, The Legend of King Arthur, and so much more. He worked rapidly and experimented constantly, often working on a larger scale than necessary. He could conceive, sketch out, and paint a large painting in as little as three hours. I am a huge fan of Wyeth, and I highly recommend you look up his work. You won't regret it. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 38 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Persephone by Dante Rossetti. Want to join me? Gabriel Charles Dante Rossetti was an English painter and poet who co-founded the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood in 1848 with William Holman Hunt and John Everett Millay. You may remember my study of Millay's Ophelia from day 14 of Studying the Masters, and the story of how his model, Elizabeth Siddle, got very ill posing for him in a bathtub that went cold. Well, Rossetti fell in love with Siddle and demanded that she no longer model for any other artist but him. She was his muse, and he wanted her all to himself. She agreed, but in return, she wanted him to mentor her. She had paintings she wanted to make. So, for 10 years, the two worked together. She, his model, he, her teacher and agent. This all would have been wonderful, except she became addicted to laudanum, and he was serially unfaithful. When Siddle fell ill due to her addiction, Rossetti finally proposed, and the two were married. Siddle died two years later, and Rossetti's life spiraled into a haze of chloral and whiskey and bad poetry. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 39 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Spring by Edward Manet. Want to join me? Edouard Manet, not to be confused with Claude Monet, is one of the founders of Impressionism. He began painting in a quasi-realistic style, which transitioned to a more Impressionist style when he met painter Bert Morisot, who exposed him to her circles of Impressionist painter friends, including Claude Monet, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and Edgar Degas. Now, I know there's a bit of confusion as to the difference between Manet and Monet, so here's a few easy ways to tell. First, Manet liked to work mostly indoors, posing models and staging his paintings. Monet was an outdoors painter, his subjects almost always in nature. Manet also was a bit more realistic, where Monet was definitely more of an impressionist. Closer in style to Van Gogh. Loose, free, you can see his paint strokes. And if you still get confused, don't sweat it. They would do salon shows together, and because the paintings were presented alphabetically, they were always next to each other, and always getting compliments and criticisms from patrons on each other's work. They were good friends and laughed about it. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. 
Hey, it's day 40 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying La Belle Dame Sans Merci by Frank Dixie. Want to join me? If ever the words born in due season were true to any artist, they were true of Frank Dixie. He succeeded not because he painted what people wanted, but because people wanted what he painted. Another one of my favorite pre-Raphaelite painters, Dixie's art perfectly embodies romanticism and magic, and I hope I can see an original in person one day. Now this particular painting, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, otherwise known as The Beautiful Lady Without Mercy, is based on a ballad produced by English poet John Keats. And it's about a fairy who condemns a knight to an unpleasant fate, and she seduces him with his eyes and singing. The poem goes like this. I met a lady in the meads, full beauty, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me, she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 41 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Kiss by Auguste Rodin. Want to join me? Francois-Auguste René Rodin was a French sculptor generally considered the founder of modern sculpture. He's the guy who did the thinker. That's the one you all know. But we're not going to talk about Rodin today because when I was researching him, I discovered the woman behind Rodin's success, Camille Claudel. From the story I read, Camille was an assistant of Rodin's from the age of 19. She would work alongside Rodin, creating the more difficult parts like the hands and feet. She was his equal in every way, but because she was a woman, she couldn't get into the art schools, nor could she get commissioned to get work from paying customers. Rodin and Claudel had a 10-year love affair, but Rodin Rodin would never commit to her because he already had a girlfriend he wouldn't leave. Rodin often signed his name on Claudel's work, mainly because Claudel couldn't earn money any other way and Rodin was already such a huge name. Eventually Claudel went insane, destroyed her work, and died alone in an asylum. Rodin is remembered as one of the greatest sculptors in modern history, but if you have time, look up the artist Camille Claudel. Celebrate her work if we can. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 42 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Lady Agnew of Loch Nah by John Singer Sargent. Want to join me? Sargent was considered to be the leading portrait painter of his generation, but he had a rocky start. When his most controversial work, Portrait of Madame X, was unveiled in Paris in 1884, it aroused such a negative reaction that it prompted him to leave Paris. His portrait of Lady Agnew of Loch Nah in 1892 changed all that. Suddenly, he was getting commissions from everyone, including King Edward VII. He's truly one of the greatest portrait artists to have ever lived. Now we're at the part of his personal life. Just a reminder, I am not an art historian, and I'm learning all of this along with you. You see, most of the stories that I'm reading reveals that Sargent was indeed gay. But because of laws back then, specifically the Labouche Amendment of 1885, it was illegal with a punishment of a lifetime of imprisonment for being gay. Sargent and many others of the time had to keep this a secret, and I'm worried that I'm outing these artists. But you've all told me so many times in the comments that these stories need to be told, that seeing that gay artists were out there living and making history is a good thing. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 43 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Self-Portrait by Norman Rockwell. Want to join me? Norman always wanted to be an artist and got his first job as an art director at Boys Life magazine at the early age of 18. In 1916, at 22 years old, Rockwell painted his first cover for the Saturday Evening Post. The magazine was considered by Rockwell to be the greatest show window in America. Over the next 47 years, another 321 Rockwell covers would appear on the cover of the Post. During World War II in 1943, inspired by President Franklin Roosevelt's address to Congress, Rockwell illustrated the Four Freedoms paintings. The works toured the United States in an exhibition that was jointly sponsored by the Saturday Evening Post and the U.S. Treasury Department, and through the sale of war bonds raised more than $130 million for the war effort. In 1963, he ended his 47-year association with the Saturday Evening Post and began to work for Look Magazine. During his 10-year association with Look, Rockwell painted pictures illustrating some of his deepest concerns and interests, including civil rights, the American War on Poverty, and the exploration of space. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 44 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Want to join me? When hired to do this mural, Leonardo da Vinci had never done a fresco before, so the materials he used were not the best, and within 10 years the painting was already deteriorating. Painted on an exterior wall in a low-lying part of the city, prone to flooding with inferior materials, by 1517 the painting was almost unrecognizable. Add to that it was exposed to steam and smoke from a nearby kitchen as well as candles placed nearby nightly. By 1582 it was said to be in a state of total ruin. Around 1652 a door was cut into the painting destroying Jesus' feet. In 1796 Napoleon's army took control of Milan, Italy, and would spend their free time throwing rocks, bricks, and horse manure at Leonardo's work. 1800 brought a flood leading to a thick green mold covering the entire painting. In 1847, it was said that the work will never more be seen by the eye of man. The greater part is perished forever. Author Henry James later wrote, The Last Supper is the saddest work of art in the world. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. 
It's day 45 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Jatayu Fights Ravina by Raja Ravi Varma. Want to join me? In 1866, at the age of 18, Varma was married to 12-year-old Bhagirathi Bayi. The marriage, which was arranged by the parents in the proper Indian manner, was harmonious and successful. Varma was closely related to the royal family by his marriage. Later in his life, two of his granddaughters were adopted into the royal family, and their descendants comprised the totality of the present royal family, including the last three Maharajas. He was most notable for making affordable lithographs of his paintings available to the public, which greatly enhanced his reach and influence as a painter and public figure. His lithographs increased the involvement of common people with fine arts and defined artistic taste among common people. Ravi Varma's representation of the mythological characters has become a part of the Indian imagination of the epics. His works are one of the best examples of the fusion of European academic art with a purely Indian sensibility and iconography. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 46 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Accolade by Edmund Blair Leighton. Want to join me? Okay, I really love this painting, and honestly, there's a few more by this artist that really just hits me in the romance and chivalry department. But there's nothing on his life. Like, even his Wikipedia page is boring. Edmund Blair Leighton seems to have lived a fine life, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, and I don't want to get too philosophical here, don't you want to have something interesting to say about you 100 years from now? A lifetime of charity work? Rescuing a baby from a burning building? Wrote a book? Involved in a royal scandal? discovered a planet, I don't know, something? Give future art historians something to work with, something interesting. Artists, live your life, make some noise. Otherwise, future art historians may have to fill the time with bossa nova themed hold music where your life was supposed to be. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 47 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich. Want to join me? A 19th century German romantic painter, Friedrich's work featured landscapes in an entirely new way than his predecessors and contemporaries. So from what I could learn about this, Friedrich made landscapes the main character. The environment was the story, not the people in them. His work made landscapes romantic, powerful, awe-inspiring. This was a game changer for its time. Artists from all over the world would flock to Germany to study his art. Additionally, he'd add symbolism to his work, and it's said that this was the spark that birthed the symbolist movement. But times changed and romanticism fell out of style. Friedrich fell into a depression, isolating himself from his family and friends. From what I read, Friedrich was a romantic. You can see it in his work. But he wasn't much of a people person either. This quote really seems to sum up his personality. You call me a misanthrope because I avoid society. You err. I love society. Yet, in order not to hate people, I must avoid their company. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 48 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Midsummer's Eve by Edward Robert Hughes. Want to join me? Hughes was an English painter who worked prominently in watercolors and gouache. I like this guy already. While pre-Raphaelitism played an influential part in shaping Hughes's work, aestheticism is also seen in his paintings. In addition to being an accomplished artist himself, Hughes was also a studio assistant to the elder artist and pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood founding member William Holman Hunt. Midsummer's Eve is a painting from the traditional Victorian genre of fairies, shown frolicking in their natural woodland environment. A ring of winged, plump, childlike creatures gather around a young woman, perhaps a wood nymph. Holding a flute under her arms, her golden dress lifted, the woman poses as if she'd been invited to perform a song. Her stage, the loamy grass, her curtain, the lush leaves of the trees, and her floodlights, the illuminated shells, flowers, and seed pods held aloft by her miniature audience. In this mix of the natural and the supernatural, the theatrical and the real, Hughes succeeds in creating a mood rather than a narrative, providing a peek into a world outside the troubles of our mundane reality. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 49 of 60 days of studying the masters, and today we're studying The Gulf Stream by Winslow Homer. Want to join me? He was born in Boston to a mother who was a gifted amateur watercolorist and a father who was a volatile, restless businessman. In 1861, Harper's Weekly Magazine sent Homer to the front lines of the American Civil War, where he sketched battle scenes and camp life, the quiet moments, as well as the murderous ones. In 1883, Homer moved to Prout's Neck, Maine, where he was preoccupied with the power of the ocean and often made it the subject of his art. Homer based this dramatic scene of imminent disaster on sketches and watercolors he made during his winter trips to the Bahamas in 1884, after crossing the Gulf Stream several times. A man faces his demise on a dismantled, rudderless fishing boat, sustained only by a few stalks of sugar cane, while threatened by sharks and a distant waterspout. He is oblivious to the schooner on the left horizon, which Homer later added to the composition as a sign of hopeful rescue, painted shortly after the death of his father in 1898. The painting has been interpreted as an expression of the artist's presumed sense of mortality and vulnerability. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 50 of 60 days of studying the masters, and today we're studying Perseus with the head of Medusa by Benvenuto Cellini. 
Want to join me? Cellini was a celebrated Renaissance sculptor and goldsmith. He was a murderer and a braggart, a shameless adventurer who might either trust you with his life's work or run you through with a sword, depending on his mood. Innkeepers and prostitutes, kings and cardinals, artists and soldiers, Cellini made friends and enemies of all of them. At various times, he mortally offended the Pope, more than one Duke of Florence, and the King of France. And how do I know this? Because apparently, he wrote an autobiography. And while I'm just kind of catching up on this now, it's supposedly really good. I mean, I just read a chapter where he goes to Sicily to learn necromancy, like some real black magic stuff. He goes into great detail of the incantations, the spells, demons and ghosts. It's pretty insane. From what I could gather, Cellini may not have been a good person by any measure, but he sure could tell a story because 500 years later, people are still fascinated with his life. I'm curious, if you've read his autobiography, please leave a comment with your thoughts. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 51 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Gibson Girls by Charles Dana Gibson. Want to join me? He sold his first work to Life magazine in 1886, and from that point on, his art appeared weekly in the popular national magazine for more than 30 years. He quickly built a wider reputation with his drawings being featured in all major New York publications and several illustrated books. Gibson was married to Irene Langhorne, and she and her elegant Langhorne sisters became a constant inspiration for his famous Gibson Girls, an iconic representation of the beautiful and independent Euro-American woman at the turn of the 20th century. Gibson's drawings of American society defined the age contemporaneously and retrospectively, from the 1890s through the early 1900s. Oh, and for anyone wondering, contemporaneously means that it happened while he was still alive. I looked it up. His images of women in particular were so influential on in development of the American feminine style that the term Gibson Girls became part of everyday lexicon. Almost unrestricted merchandising saw his distinct sketches appear in many forms, and he was considered the most celebrated pen and ink artist of his time. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 52 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Moulin Rouge by Henry Toulouse-Lautrec. Want to join me? His parents were actually first cousins, and this, along with his family's history of inbreeding, caused Henry to suffer many health conditions, including shortened legs that never fully developed, leaving him with a full torso and baby-like legs. His adult height reported to be under five feet tall. Physically unable to participate in many activities enjoyed by kids his age, he immersed himself in art. With his studies finished in 1887, he participated in an exposition in Toulouse and later exhibited in Paris with Van Gogh. In 1890, during a banquet in Brussels, Lautrec challenged artist Henry de Groo to a duel. When de Groo criticized Van Gogh's work, de Groo apologized and the duel never took place. Toulouse-Lautrec was a frequent patron of the local prostitutes in Moulin Rouge. The girls in the brothels inspired him, and he created about 100 drawings and 50 paintings inspired by the life of these women. From what I read, Toulouse-Lautrec loved four things, art, cooking, women, and alcohol. Unfortunately, the last two wound up killing him. He died of alcoholism and syphilis at the age of 36. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 53 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Self-Portrait of Suffering by Ibrahim El Salahi. Want to join me? Born in Sudan, he was a former public servant and diplomat who became one of the foremost visual artists of the Khartoum School, considered as part of African modernism. His artwork combines traditional forms of Islamic calligraphy with contemporary painting. El Salahi spent just over six months wrongly imprisoned without trial in Sudan. The hardships he endured there has informed much of his later work. Prisoners weren't allowed to write or draw, and if a prisoner was caught with paper or pencil, they'd be punished with solitary confinement for 15 days. Despite this, El Salahi was able to find a pencil and often used the brown paper bags that food was distributed with to draw on. He would tear the bag into numerous pieces and could use the 25 exercise minutes he'd receive every day to sketch out huge paintings. He would also secretly sketch and bury small drawings into the sand to maintain his ideas. El Salahi was released in March of 1976 and didn't keep any of the drawings that he made in prison. He left them buried in the sand at the prison, never to be seen again. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 54 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters and today we're studying Group 10 Number 1 Altarpiece by Hilma Af Klint. Wanna join me? A Swedish artist, mathematician, and mystic, she's one of the earliest women to study at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. Hilma inherited a great interest in mathematics and botany, but a twist of fate would change her direction when she lost her younger sister in 1880. From that point on, her artwork and everything changed. She formed a group of like-minded women, and they called themselves the Five. They would hold regular seance sessions and communicate with mediums. Her work became more mathematical, more mechanical, like diagrams or instructions to something bigger than her. In 1906, a spiritual guide commissioned her, asking her to prepare an artistic message for humankind. For the next nine years, she produced over 193 paintings in an attempt to represent the spirit world. She kept them private, not showing anyone. It wasn't until 20 years after her death that they were finally seen by the public. But by this time, male artists Kandinsky and Mondrian were already being lauded for ushering in the era of abstract art, despite Helma F. Klimt's work predating theirs by decades. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 55 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying The Colossus by Francisco Goya. Want to join me? 
A Spanish romantic painter and printmaker, he is considered the most important Spanish artist of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. His artwork reflected contemporary historical upheavals and influenced important 19th and 20th century painters, and he's often referred to as one of the last of the old masters and the first of the moderns. He suffered a severe and undiagnosed illness in 1793, which left him deaf, and led his work to become progressively darker and pessimistic. In 1807, Napoleon led the French army into the Peninsular War against Spain. Goya remained in Madrid during the war, which affected him deeply and was reflected in his Disasters of War series of prints. Goya eventually he eventually abandoned Spain in 1824 to retire to the French city of Bordeaux. He died and was buried in April 1828. His body was later reinterred in the Real Ermita de San Antonio de la Florida in Madrid. Famously, the skull was missing, a detail the Spanish consul immediately communicated to the superiors in Madrid, who wired back, send Goya with or without his head. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 56 of 60 days of studying the masters, and today we're studying The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. Want to join me? Alessandro de Mariano Filippi took the name Botticelli from his older brother Giovanni, a pawnbroker who was called Botticello, or Little Barrel. Botticelli is the earliest European artist whose paintings of secular historical subjects survive and are equal or superior in importance to his religious paintings. Much of his secular work has been lost and only eight examples survive. The Birth of Venus is one such example. The Birth of Venus shows the goddess of love and beauty arriving on land, on the island of Cyprus, born of the sea spray and blown there by the winds, Zephyr and perhaps Aura. The goddess is standing on a giant scallop shell as pure and as perfect as a pearl. She is met by a young woman who is sometimes identified as one of the graces and who holds out a cloak covered in flowers. Botticelli never married, saying the idea gave him nightmares. And there's two theories as to why. The first is that he fell in love with the model who posed for Venus. He requested to be buried at her feet when he died. Rumors in journals, though, suggest that he was gay, as he, quote, had a boy on the side. But why not both? And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 57 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're going to be studying an Assyrian relief panel. Want to join me? I'm half Assyrian on my mom's side, so before the series was over, I wanted to study something from my heritage, something a bit more personal. This panel represents a supernatural protective figure, similar to those seen in the Northwest Palace at Nimrud, but comes from another important structure at the same site, the Ninurta Temple. Like the palace, the Ninurta Temple was built by Ashur Nasirpal II in 1883 to 1859 BC. Ninurta was an important god in the Mesopotamian pantheon. In origin, he was an agricultural deity, but for the Assyrian kings, it was an association with war and victory that gave him particular significance. One relief from the Ninurta Temple depicts the god's most famous mythological exploits, recovering the Tablet of Destinies, on which was written the future of humanity from the Anzu bird, a demon who often appears in art as a lion-headed eagle. There is no more Assyria. It doesn't exist anymore. All we have left is the art displayed in museums and the language and customs passed down from generation to generation. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 58 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Michelangelo's David. Want to join me? His full name was Michelangelo di Lodovico Buonarroti Simoni, otherwise simply known as Michelangelo. He was an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and poet of the High Renaissance, born in the Republic of Florence. His artistic versatility was of such a high order that he's often considered the archetypal Renaissance man, along with his rival and elder contemporary, Leonardo da Vinci. Created in marble between 1501 and 1504, David is a 17-foot marble statue of the biblical figure David. It was originally commissioned as one of the series of statues of prophets to be positioned along the roofline of the east end of the Florence Cathedral, but was instead placed in a public square outside of the Palazzo Vecchio, the seat of government in Florence. In his lifetime, Michelangelo was often called Il Divino, the Divine One. A number of Michelangelo's works ranks among the most famous in existence, and several scholars have described Michelangelo as the greatest artist of his age and even as the greatest artist of all time. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 59 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying Marcel René Lancelot. Want to join me? She was born into a family of artists, her father being a lithographer and her other siblings were sculptors. Marcel had a natural talent and the ability to model bas reliefs and carve steel medals. She spent the year 1890 traveling around Italy and stayed in Rome. It was on this occasion that she met sculptor Leonardo Croce, whom she married in 1892. She won a gold medal at the Universal Exhibition of 1900 and the first place at the Universal Exhibition of 1906 in Milan. Her winning piece, a bas relief, was named the King of Calabria. She reached the peak of her career in the 1900 World's Fair, where where the jury awarded her the gold medal, and the French government made her the Knight of the Legion of Honor. However, her Italian marriage led Parisian critics to contest her status as a French sculptor medalist, saying she should be counted as an Italian instead. In Rome, her application for the title of Chief Engraver of the Italian Mint was rejected, despite her numerous awards and obvious talents. Why? Because, of course, she was a woman. And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours. It's day 60 of 60 Days of Studying the Masters, and today we're studying what is quite possibly one of the greatest works of art of all time, dogs playing poker. 
Want to join me? After leaving the family farm in the early 1860s, Cassius Marcellus Coolidge had many careers. Between 1868 and 1872, he worked as a druggist, sign painter, founded a bank, and a newspaper. According to the advertising firm Brown and Bigelow, from the mid-1900s to the mid-1910s, Coolidge created a series of 18 oil paintings for them. The series included the artist's original poker game painting, along with 16 other oil paintings commissioned to advertise cigars. Critic Annette Ferrara has described dogs playing poker as, quote, indelibly burned into the American collective subconscious through incessant reproduction on all manner of pop ephemera. Coolidge's 1894 painting The Poker Game sold for $658,000 at a 2015 auction. And if you look real close, the two dogs in the foreground are cheating and the rest of the dogs have no poker chips. The bulldog on the right is slipping an ace to the dog next to him. How cute is that? And that's my sketch in about an hour. Show me yours.